I'll proceed quickly to give a few minutes to yeah. 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 One part of Ms. Aurora's statement, because she's here for the first time. One aspect I need to respond to, I need about a minute, not more. Now, so therefore, Lord Shukri had these three things open, my original note, my rejoinder note, and my CL1, which is case law one. One minute now, so. Is also rejoined. It was rejoined. It was repeated earlier today. And one list of authority volume one. List of authority volume one I've got. <coughs> yes, rejoined the submissions also. Written submission is second law. Rejoined the submissions. Volume one, right? Yes. The main feature by the feature by Lord says about that. Yes. Yes. Now let's. Uh, I've got half an hour, so I'll be very pointed. So they have about ten minutes left between them. Uh, please see the larger issue for a minute, and then I'll read only some part of these two notes. The rejoinder one. Which one you want us to take first? No, not sure. I have all three open. I'm not going to follow this sequence. I'll just go between rejoin the note, my first note, and CL1. Yes. These three things are 95, 98% of my speech. I'll take a different sequence to make it shorter. Right, was no. My my opening point is this: that was if your lordships were to go by this, what I call the absolutist theory of signatory or was party in that sense, then your lordship must throw out completely the doctrine. If not, then the best your lordships can and perhaps should do is to consider where the existing law needs trimming or safeguarding. That's point number two. Trimming is a more appropriate word. Why does I say trimming? Because according to me, my lords has already fleshed out 10, 12, 15 legal principles, which ring fence that doctrine already from abuse. Now, certainly to the extent my learned friends on the opposite side tell your lordships that this doctrine ring fenced by these 15 principles needs further tweaking in this particular sentence. I am with them. I have no problem. But the problem with this case is they have not told your lordships that. They are suggesting again and again. By creating an apprehension without telling your lordships which of those safeguards needs to be key, so as to actually reduce the doctrine to vanishing point. So, well, without telling your lordships, because they know they can't say that, they can't tell your lordships normally, please throw out the group company's doctrine. Actually, that is a logical thing to say on their side. Realizing that that may either be unpalatable or unless discretion is the better part of valor. They say, no, keep the doctrine, but put so many well, unknown conditions which reduce to vanity point, which another other saying, throw it out. One of those points is, must be positive or negative wrongdoing only. Only an example, I'll be reading in a minute. Take, for example, the repercussions of that point. That means that absent, even piercing the veil, is not merely based on wrongdoing. It's a misrepresentation to your lordship to suggest that piercing the veil is based solely on wrongdoing. My lord pierces the veil in a wider set of contexts. 
But Wallace, that would mean that your lordship will either equate the group doctrine only with piercing the veil. It's not the way it is put by the other side. It amounts to that. So, Wallace, please don't, please ask them which particular safeguard and the lordship is to be reminded of those 15 safeguards. Please ask them which of these safeguards is not enough in what manner. That's a constructive exercise. I would join them in that. But because absent that, please don't let it be reduced to vanishing point by a circumvention or a camouflage. That the doctrine is okay, but in some unstated manner, don't apply it to a non-signatory or to a non-party, which means there is no doctrine at all. Now with that backdrop, Please turn to Wallace three portions in a different sequence. First, turn to my rejoinder note, the last page. I'm following a little different sequence, because it'll be quicker. But remember these three points, Wallace, which I said in the opening. With that backdrop, kindly turn to the last page of my rejoinder submission. Para? The very last page, Wallace, it's, a, it's a kind of an appendix. Seven, it's seven. not a para. Does it have the tritimus test for recognition? Yeah. Now, Manas, what I've done here is I've done the reverse, and I think you'll actually find it useful. I have Manas, put the uh, the test for the concept, and then the case law under it. It's already there, but I've done the reverse. Now, Manas, just give me a few minutes. I'll not read a single case on this page. One test is intention of parties, commonality of interest necessary to bind non-signatories. First of all, Manas, as my learned friend Ms. But Ms. Roda also said, I said in the opening, this non-signatory is well as a complete red herring phrase. This phrase non-signatory actually has no place in this jurisprudence. I'll tell you why. Because if you're a signatory, the question, the doctrine doesn't arise. It doesn't arise. Then you must have an all or nothing. The moment you're not a signatory, the doctrine doesn't arise. Full stop. Your lordship wants to throw out whatever your lordship wants to throw out. So, the whole doctrine is, yes, a non-signatory can be there to what extent? Express party, implied party. Implied party. Now, so non-signatory, of course, we are using the jurisprudence, so it's okay. It can go along, but that's, that's the concept. 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 Now come to this. Intention of parties, commonality of interest necessary to bind non-signatories. Now, let's just see. These are chapter and verse specific para where my lords has in three judges, five judges, or two judges laid it down. I'm saving time to specific para of the pinpointed. And I'm grateful to my learned friend, Manus, Mr. Imanshi Vaita Manus, for having done that exercise under my supervision, but Manus, it's useful to have it held up. And I've got CL1, which is your lordship's volume one, otherwise sometimes CL2. Now, Manus, so many times your lordship has done it, the question your lordship will ask is, what is the imperative necessity of throwing out this whole page? Because Manus, if your lordship really were to apply the true Test. Then a lot should throw out this page, reverse this page, overrule this page. Now see the next test. Alter ego piercing of corporate veil may be required. My Lord has given reasons. My Lord has had in two, three, and five years have given reasons. Now, unless something compellingly wrong is shown, there all this should be overruled. Then, Manas. Engaged in negotiation of performance of the commercial contract. Well, actually what happens is, this answers both the shielding point and the wrongdoing point. Well, it's, your lordship does look for the intent. Let me give a nuanced answer to the point here. Of course, your lordship goes by intent. But intent is both a subjective and an objective test. It's not a subjective test where I tell your lordships. I know I'm fully involved in this contract. But I will create a structure whereby, despite my full involvement, I will say my intent is to shield myself from arbitration. As one of the cases... That your lordship's objective test kicks in. Your lordship is the judge. Sir, subject, as one of the cases say, that you deduce the subjective intent of the parties from objective facts. That's my next sentence. Therefore, the subjective intent test alone is well as constitutive of great injustice, and then your lordship must overrule the doctrine. Well, as the, the, what your lordship has never done is no 
or yes or black and white. My lordship has operated in the zone of grey. Otherwise, why does the lordship have these 15 principles with us? Because your lordship knows case by case justice can't be done without these 15 principles. Otherwise, lordship says, yes, we accept it fully or we don't accept it at all. No, your lordship says we accept it, but family run companies through complex structure is one test. Yes, we accept it, but tight group structure with strong organizational financial links is another test. That is the right way to do it with respect, Malus, because your lordship will then be doing justice without Malus trade jacketing it in an exhaustive manner for unknown speculative situations in the future, which your lordship can never predict. Your lordships can never predict. Does your lordship want that injustice on a logical application of the other side's case? My respectful submission is has to be the answer has to be no. Yes, if your lordships can be pointed out any major fallacy or error in these. In this page, six principles I have given. Then your lordship can tweak it. Has anybody told your lordship specifically in what language to tweak it? With great respect, I ask that question of myself. Not really. Either it's a throw the baby out of the bathwater or say it in a generalized way without telling your lordship which principle is wrong here. And mothers, that subjective objective is very important for the Chief Justice also, mothers. That's what I Malus, if your lordship were to give extreme and dispositive, conclusive weight to subjective intent, then Malus, really your lordship is saying every non-signatory is out. Because the intent of the non-signatory is not to be bound. Then why have a signatory, why have a doctor at all? It is already, it is already that your lordship's objective intent kicks in and balances the subjective intent. But it has never been the absolute subjective intent. My Lord applies the mind what is that objectively the whole system is there. Just because he has ring fenced or created a structure, we will not leave our adjudicatory job of injecting some objective intent to do justice. That's for us the real crux of the man. So us, as I leave this page, As I leave this page, my two or three minutes takeaways, if I may use the word, is one, would your lordships have any compelling need shown to your lordships by the other side to overrule this page? Is question number one. The lordship has jurisprudence, the lordship has case law, the lordship has decisions. There must be something shown why the constitutional bench. I am not saying lordships can't do it. But really, many or all of these should be overruled. And certainly, because I find the compelling need, if at all, is the opposite side, not this side. The second takeaway from this page is that, I'm sorry, my apologies. As well, my friend adds rightly, that to 10 years after. Chloro, as your lordship is celebrating the decade of Chloro. So your lordship should overrule. Many years after, but I just, just a thought. I think uh, we haven't yet create, uh, come across a critical mass of contradictory views in the context of Chloro control principle. It's perhaps a little too early. As you are saying, That's there, are no, phrase, there, are no, there are no, uh, uh, another set of cases which uh, had proved to the court that this doctrine is excessively applied or no, no, overarched or no. wide enough, so much so that the court should take a step back and control. We haven't grateful. yet arrived at that situation, is what you're saying. I'm extremely grateful and may I, with your lordship permission, adopt that phrase, critical mass. That is the critical phrase for us. It is possible for a constitution bench, which finds a predisposition of a mass of cases this way, that, that it's either equal or heavily weighted against the Toro doctrine. It is possible the Lordship reaches a critical mass sometime in the future. Otherwise, unless really a constitution bench is being asked to do an extraordinary thing. And again, it is left unstated by them because they know if they put it like that, the Lordship would fellows find it unrelatable. So it is not put like that. To be fair, they have not put it at that level. The well, listen, that's my problem. That they have not put it actually, they mean that level. Exactly what my Lordship, that's my sufficient Lordship. Right. You are saying that. The consequence inevitable is that. That's the point. But they, Lord, they have not brought forth, as Brother Narsia said, the critical mass of so now let's, let's just look at this critical mass phrase, very important phrase. Your Lordship has got most of the cases actually on this chart. 
I mean, there will be two or three missing, but most are in this one page. Well, it's the interesting thing is that the critical mass is leaning in favor of chloro. So what is the council meant to be asked to do? It's asked to create a new status quo without showing that the existing status quo has run amok. Without demonstrating in any reasonable way that the existing status quo has run amok. For example, for example, your lordship has some judgments. I'll not name them in the old time, etc. I mean, when I can name them, I argued Balko, private with Bhatia. The lordship has evidence that well, international commerce has been affected. There's a whole UN cry. <laughs> But because well, chloro, these judgments have been controlled. They've been actually very calibrated, very careful, cautious. They've not gone overbroad. You get the point. This is the point. What's now, the, the second aspect is come to my first note. For us, section C. Well, it's just stop for 30 seconds on section B. I formulated the two issues. We must remember the origin, well, these are the only two issues. In my B.1, this is the first note, the pre opening note. I'll not read it, Lordship knows, well, this really should be a Lordship's broad guiding pole star, these two issues. And none are made out in favor of the other side. Whether the acceptance, etc., of the group doctrine by several elders is not permissible within the four corners of the 96 Act. That's a clear, good guideline to follow. And second is divorce about whether you should the original rejoinder. That's okay. The broad guideline. Now come to what is section C, category C, lower down that first note itself. First note, opening note. What are those 12 or 15 principles? I'll read a sentence each. It's the same chart, but put in the point of balance submissions, put in the form of submissions. So first is true and genuine effectuation of the real intent of parties. But real intent where it becomes a form of avoidance, no, then the objective test comes in. Suppose the Lord should to find in a case that the real intent actually by performance, by context, by negotiation is not to be involved. Then the Lord should say no, there is no group doctrine. It is not bound by arbitration. The Lord should be entitled to the existing law. What is wrong with that law? My Lord says enough tools not to punish for us an innocent party. Second, related part entities playing a predominant role both at the negotiation stage at the inception and in the performance. Now suppose Malus, both these tests are, this is an answer also to the subjective objective which my Lord's Chief Justice formulated. Suppose your Lordship gives a finding of fact in act, not this case, actual case, that I am fully involved in negotiation, plus I am fully involved in performance. But because I am a foreigner, I have so designed it that I don't want to be caught in arbitration. Doesn't matter. Sorry, doesn't matter. The Lord should, should be able to control that. Absence as a group doctrine would allow evasion and avoidance of legitimate collective responsibility. That's a consequence. I'll leave that. Hyper-technical approach. I'll leave that. Now, well, certainly the veil doctrine, even they have conceded. That's well, C.5. Even they are conceding in some form or the other. But certainly I am not agreeing that it is, well, it's coincide with only the veil doctrine. Less or not seen, a very, very important well, concept is C11. This is a judicial policy and a public policy. Not that well as any single swallow will make a summer. No single malus point is enough. But the totality of Lordship will see. In a genuine case where Lordship gets a fragmentation malus, why should Lordship allow it? In effect, you are using it to, to stop for legitimate arbitration. Look at malus, your Lordship's pro arbitration approach in a whole set of jurisprudence. In effect, C11 means you are thwarting arbitration. Because you are fragmenting it. In effect, no effective decree is passed. Then, well, I have given C9, which is composite and all that. 
Anyway, but this is just to remind my that all of these principles are there. I'm not reading about them. There are about 12 or 14 of them. Well, there's a word here, and then I go back to my agenda now. C15 and C16 are more important than they are given the weight of. Claiming through or under the law commission is not being enough, enough weight by the other side. If that is so malus, then merely saying non dignities will not malus nullify this. I have given various reasons for C15 and C16 that has not been answered, that has not been really, really dealt with. That, according to me, malus, I reiterate fully. The entirety of the law commission, the 21H argument, section 8, I'm saving time, I'm not reading it, malus, that is an important consideration in a particular case. Now I come, malus, to my rejoinder note. I return to my rejoinder note. Very quickly, I will finish even time. First is, who is a party must be in accord and comply with principles of law or not. That's the point. I will not read the point, but I will read the response. 72 of chloro in my CL1 provides for clear intent to bind signatory and non-signatory, cannot be restricted only to intention to consider peers of operative or delivery type group structure. Same point I have made. Second point made is party autonomy. So, the first point I really made, fellowship appreciates what I'm saying. I'm not really reading it. First, second is party autonomy. Kindly come to Willis, my response. It is essential to understand the true intent by way of their conduct. It is simply the reliance on party autonomy would negate the doctrine. This honorable court in OHGC in para 40 has laid down the test mutual intention, relationship of a non signatory. Commonality of subject matter, composite nature, performance of contract. What's the point of ring fencing with five safeguard policies if it is so simple? Well, it's party autonomy, then all this is useless. Clearly, I have a non-signatory. Clearly, I have not learned. What's the point of order of On the contrary, order of is finding a way to effectuate the doctrine while protecting. And that's the right approach. Third, the privity of contract. Same answer. These are all traditional doctrines. Law will not advance if you go back to privity. Because how many categories does the law should have where privity is not sacrosanct? Does the law should have less categories of privity not sacrosanct? Because there is a book by Michael Atia, which I read in my student days, The Beginning of the End of Contractual Intent. <laughs> this is written almost, almost 70 years ago. English people who are conservative found the beginning of the end of contractual intent. And a lot of us today told party autonomy and contractual intent is conclusive with this positive. Maybe one of the, how the same cannot be the sole basis. In fact, case of non signatory, this court is just the doctrine of piercing the corporate will. Non signatory will be held to be bound on a consensual theory, found on agency, assigned to non consensual basis, a stop of ordering. The courts have added additional elements, common intention, negotiation. These are of juristic principles by eminent authors and a lot of judgments which has adopted those authors. Gary Bond, etc. have given these theories. Then we just hold. It's a repetition of the theory. With the para giving of para 39 ONGC. Para 4 is that. Now this through or under is para 5. Through or under. Through or under relates to my first zone, C15 and C16. Just to cross reference it once. My first zone, C15 and C16. In addition, it has been held in Paragraph 73 of Chloro that a non signatory could be subject to arbitration without their prior consent in exceptional cases. The court may lay down the parameters which permit lay the joints. The court will examine these exceptions from the customer of direct relationship of the party to the agreement, direct commonality and agreement between the parties being a composite transaction. Then, well, this, this, uh, this US and Germany, I'm not spending time in para 6. We so will come to para 8. A point I've already made for this. Compelling reason, entrenched doctrine in Indian law. Compelling reason not shown to your lordship. An entrenched doctrine is para 8. There are nine malus about implied consent, a phrase which fell from a lordship, section 7. The above submissions cannot be accepted for the reasons A. Doctrine be applied in facts and such that each case cannot be a straightjacket formula. And if you're not sure to find, 
adopt this all or nothing, then there will be no gray area. Russia can't handle individual cases in future then. But the GCD is a reasonable and a natural extension of PRC prevailed doctrine. Some or all already established legal tests regarding PRC would be applicable depending on individual facts. Then, well, you have chosen a private forum is argument number 10. Parties have a right to choose the forum and the parties to the agreement, but circumstances arise where a non signatory company can be roped into arbitration because the court found the existence, quote unquote, well, from MTNL. A tight group structure with strong organizational and financial links so as to constitute a single economic unit or a single economic reality. If you have comes to that factual conclusion in a case, why should Malas, the tyranny of an intention doctrine defeat this? Is my question to myself. Then Malas, 11. Ivan and for Mr. Advani, but I would beseech my lords to keep one thing in mind. Your lordship already has sufficient guidance, sufficient guidelines. Naturally, your lordships can tweak it in a, this way, that way, a little bit to make sure it's strengthened. But because otherwise, there is nothing in this case in terms of either absolutist or completely. Otherwise, it would actually wreak havoc on what is now as an established trend of law. That's, that's a very deep. Thank you, Dr. Singhvi. Amongst the multifold talents that you have, do you also have the talent of lip reading? Lip reading. <laughs> Listen, even if I did, well, I would not disclose. It's a very valuable talent so long as it's kept hidden. Plus, that's a talent by itself. <laughs> well, well, I can assure lots of I don't. Well, I don't. I don't. And I'm glad to hear the, the, the subtext of what Lord Shiv says seems to be in my favor. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm never presumptuous about adjudication. Dr. Singhi, you may not want to do no, it. Knows. <laughs> yeah. You may not want to reveal a bar secret, but I can tell you a secret which I picked up. I was sitting exactly where your junior is sitting and where you are standing, Mr. Pali Nariman was leading me. That was the withdrawal of the prosecution of the Chief Minister Section Power under Section 321 of the CRPC. Oh, yes. Uh, had come up and had been referred to a constitution bench preserved by Chief Justice Bhagwati. 
Shivanandan passed one with us. Right, Shivanandan. I was on the opposite side. Three Supreme Court. I was on the opposite side. And, uh, you know, that was where just Bharu. 3 2. Justice Venkat Ramayana, 3 2. That's right. They ultimately, the, the matter went 3 2 in the Constitution. That's right, today. 3 2. So the judges were conversing, and I was in, I was briefing Mr. Sitting by Mr. Uh, senior Mr. Nariman. And I thought that I'll use the time, you know, to tell him what our next line of authority was going to be. So he turns to me and says, Never, never speak when the judges are speaking. So I said, sorry, Mr. Silver. When we left the court at four o'clock, he says, that's when you get to know the mind of the judges. <laughs> <laughs> Something which has not left me, you know, learning lessons on the grades of the bar. You know? I, shall, I shall pay more attention to the very wise advice. <laughs> so we are now inventing how to read the minds of lawyers while sitting here. <laughs> I believe that. Deeply obliged. Very deeply obliged. Your lordships know what happens uh, when we are on this side. Yes. Plus, I'll just take about a minute and a half, the 10, 15 seconds for me to respond to what Ms. Arora said. On yeah. One minute, minutes to respond. As far as the submission which Ms. Arora had made, there's just one aspect I want to point out. That while it is a section 9, the entire determination which your lordship will see at paragraph 6, 7 and 12 of the judgment was only on the proof of company's doctrine. So as far as the issue is concerned, the issue is in fact the identical issue that your lordship is hearing in 501. So it shouldn't be delinked in any form. That, that's the only one point I want to make. But it's just one thing that fell from my Lord Justice Narasimha which is in relation to the, has the critical mass of cases been brought before my laws to say there's some kind of abuse or not. Because I think there are two ways to look at this. Point. The first way, my laws, is which are the two countries we are akin with, at least as far as adoption of the model law is concerned, and one of the localized theory, England and Singapore. And both those countries have rejected the doctrine, we have not. So, are you really consistent with two other countries which follow us the same? It is my respectful submission is no, that's one part of the critical mass. Well, I don't want to give you evidence at the bar, but I can tell your lordship that there are at least 15 or 20 cases where I have been involved with international domestic where these issues crop up very, very often. Now, obviously, they're not there before my lords because if a section 16 gets dismissed and jurisdiction is upheld, because awards take time to come, 34s are challenged, the issues may not be there. Before. But there are a number of these issues, and therefore, when your lordships is considering it, all I am requesting for is bringing about a level of certainty. Now, why would I not apply this if I was in Singapore and London? I wouldn't apply it there because if a group structure is brought, party takes a simpler route. It goes to the English Commercial Court or it goes to the Singapore International Commercial Court or it goes to the Singapore High Court and says, I don't need to go to arbitration. I have a great commercial remedy. I go to court, I get the injunction. I want to get a trial disposed of within two years, three years, and that's the end of the matter. We have a commercial court structure here. All and right. that's really, Malut, let's, uh, so let's give five minutes to Mr. Mr. Radwani. Malut, I'm, I'm, not, I'm I'm just for Malut, not for a very patient hearing. And I must just point out to my Malut one very interesting aspect. It's a very personal aspect. The first time I appeared before a CB, was in 2012 in the Balco case. When I appeared for the Singapore International Arbitration Center, which had filed an intervention application, and I got my seven and a half minutes on that side of the table, right towards the end. So this is in fact, from an arbitration perspective, the second time, I mean, I've appeared before other CVs, I mean, over that 10, 12 year period. But from an arbitration perspective, this is the second time I've actually addressed a CV on Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And I'm deeply grateful for a very few Thank you, Dr. Singhvi. Yes, I, want to, I just want to present a slightly different perspective. I'm not going through any case law. Your lordship has heard it all. But all institutions all over the world, and I have been part of two of them, the Singapore Arbitration Center and the Dubai Arbitration Center, the appointment of arbitrators is done by the institution. It is not a big judicial exercise. They are prima facie appointed. And then the arbitrators go into the issues, whether the group company document or any other theories that are there when non-signatories can be joined. And based on the facts, they make the decision. 
And now here also under R section 11 has been amended. It has not come into effect, but I'm told it's very close to coming to effect. The draft rules of the institutions have been published and that process is on. Ultimately, it will be the institutions doing this role that your lordships are doing today. So if your lordships leave the issues open as widely as possible for every conceivable issue where the arbitrator thinks it's appropriate to join the uh, non-signatory, let him take the decision. There may be seven different theories. Why does your lordship confine them? After all, if your lordship recorrects, the whole group concept of, doc, uh, doc, uh, concept of group companies has come from where? From Dow Chemicals. It's come from an award. It's not come from a court decision. And since now, we're also going to the, toward the appointment of arbitrators by the institutions, the institutions appoint only prima facie. The arbitrators will come to finding the fact one way or the other and decide this issue. And we've also done arbitrations all over the globe. The arbitrators have considered it sensibly and joined or refused to join party. This is happening consistently all over the globe. Why are we taking a, a restrictive view to this? Let's keep all the judgments are in place. They're well reasoned. Why do they need to be tinkered with? We have a stable body of judgments. Let the arbitrators follow them, whichever route they think is appropriate. They'll either agree they'll join the party or they won't join. Why do we do a narrow, uh, narrowing exercise? Let the exercise be as broad as possible. And if an arbitrator goes too much out of line, the courts are there to correct him in a 34 application. So lordships will keep the judgments exactly as they are. The points raised in Justice Ramana's judgment were already answered by Justice Surakhan's judgment. There are several different, different tests. Why does your lordship want to narrow them? Let the arbitrator apply it depending on the facts of each case. And sooner or later, this is going to be an institutional exercise, not a court exercise. So let's leave it as wide as possible. Let's leave the arbitrator ample room to make decisions. And if they go so wrong, the courts will correct them. Now that was just a perspective I wanted to give your lordship. I'm obliged. Thank you, Mr. Bani. Thank you very much. So we'll... Uh... I just had a small request to make. Included. That means reserved. Yes. I just had a small request to make. Because we had also intervened. IEA 58750 of 2023. May I have your lordship's leave? We'll put in written submissions. I want to prune it down in view of what has transpired. Not more than two pages. Absolutely. Okay. We'll try to keep it short. Grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.